I'm currently writing my sixth book, uh, which is uh, also a college level um, textbook, primarily for computer scientists, uh, called Mastering the Lightning Network um, in the Mastering series. Um, and the only thing I would add to your introduction, thank you, it was very kind of you, is um, that I, I'm not uh, an economist, I'm not a financial advisor, and nothing I say here will constitute financial advice. I'm a computer scientist. I'm interested in the technology of distributed systems, and I'm also very passionate about the social impact of technology, especially technology that relates to privacy and speech online. Uh, and I see Bitcoin as intimately connected to privacy and speech. So, um, and that, that's the angle I take in my work. Let me um, get started with uh, a question about um, just your own uh, personal situation before uh, Evan is on here as well. He's one of my former students that I invited to come back because he helped me get connected with you a while ago. And at that time, four or five years ago, um, Bitcoin wasn't as well known commonly. I would say that it was seen in a negative light because of um, dark web uses and things like that. Uh, and you're now in a much different position. You become a, an expert. You're not really fighting an uphill battle to have to explain what Bitcoin is. Um, but one of the students was kind of asking, uh, after watching one of your YouTube videos, that you talked about your obsession with Bitcoin when you first started out and that you lost 26 pounds. And in this class, we've talked about balance and self-care. So how did you kind of pull yourself out of the obsessive state and work to take care of yourself? Or are you still, uh, I assume you probably wouldn't be alive if you were still in that kind of obsessive state. But. Yeah, no, that, that lasted about four months. Uh, and it was in mid 2012, when I first came across Bitcoin, and it was the fifth or sixth time that had happened in my life where um, a, a technology primarily had captured my attention. Um, it's just part of my personality. I tend to hyper focus on things that fascinate me. And when I do, um, I turn off my surroundings and I'm oblivious to what's happening in the world. And it also seems to turn off my sense of um, self, so I forget to eat. Uh, it's a crash diet, which is not recommended. In fact, I believe any competent medical professional would warn against uh, that approach to weight loss. Um, no, I'm, I have a much better, better and balanced life now. It was, a, it was a brief interlude with intellectual fugue. <laughs> Very good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um... A lot of students have the same sort of question about when will Bitcoin become the currency we all use? Now, of course, here in the US, we kind of have pretty good monetary systems. I mean, there's definitely inequalities and such, but um, uh, so where's the tipping point or will it be Bitcoin? Will it be a Thridium or one of these other coins? What's your current outlook on this? Bitcoin may never become the currency we, we all use, but um, what has changed because of Bitcoin and all of the other things it spawned is the idea that you only use one currency, and that's the currency that has your queen or flag or founding father printed on it, um, and that currency is a national affair um, created by the sovereign. That, that idea was as obsolete as Air France being the only company you could take to fly into France. Um, and we managed to break one of those in the 70s, and now we broke the other one in 2009. So the idea of national currency as the only currency you, you can really practically use is, is now dead. Um, for many people, that's not really useful or important use, and that's because their currency works. But here's the important thing to understand. 13% um, of humanity lives in countries with liberal democracies and a stable reserve currency. 87% of humanity lives in places with either illiberal government or broken currency or both. And 
what Bitcoin represents is a choice for the six and a half billion people who have very little access to international resources, the ability to uh, get a job and work across borders over the internet, to get paid for that job, to invest in their retirement or um, for the future of their family, or to receive investments because they came up with a great idea. So the idea of creating a, a unified world economy, whether that uses Bitcoin or it uses a variety of other digital currencies that are open and accessible to everyone, um, is something that, in my opinion, is going to happen, is already happening in the places where it's needed the most. Uh, this currency is already having an enormous impact in countries that are suffering from hyperinflation or that are under brutal dictatorships or emerging dictatorships that are being fought by uh, various political um, factions. So uh, the idea of an open economic system that mirrors the internet is such an obvious idea. Um, and the only thing that stood in its way was that any previous attempt to change that status quo was stomped on by governments that had every reason to want to maintain the status quo. And the only difference with Bitcoin is that it can't be stomped on. And as a result, um, it continues to be there. I noticed that you refer to it as kind of a post-national, right? So it's not tied to a country. It's not, mm -hmm. not tied to anything else. It's truly decentralized net, uh, network. And so if you remember students, we did uh, in our blockchain game, um, we had a decentralized decision-making. There was no one central authority. And so that's the same sort of thing here. Uh, that's pretty uh, fascinating. I know I have, I have a friend of mine that she's a faculty member in uh, uh, Ukraine. And she was asking me, how do I, how to, how do I uh, invest in different um, you know, opportunities? Because she's really worried about her economy there. And uh, I said, well, you just get it, put it in Vanguard. And then I remembered, oh yeah, you're not gonna put it in Vanguard. You're not gonna put it in HSBC. You're not gonna put it in all these other things. So I think that's something that we're really kind of myopic to here in, in the US. Um, you talk about exponential, this is another question from a student. You talk about exponential growth and innovation happening before our eyes so quickly that we cannot understand its importance. What habits or uh, what, what tricks do you use to kind of understand and keep up with exponential growth? And how, what would you recommend to the students to try and understand what's going on? Um, I think one of the, one of the main uh, things to keep in mind when it comes to exponential growth is that the nature of exponential growth is alien to human brains. And um, it's almost impossible to really adopt an exponential mindset. And so what will always happen in that environment is you will overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. Um, in an exponential curve, um, there are really two main phases to an exponential curve. In the beginning, it looks almost horizontal. So very little is happening and it's growing, but because it starts from zero, um, it's almost a flat line experience. And then you hit the elbow of the curve and it, the, from the local perspective, it turns almost vertical. And so you go from two experiences that look like they're completely the opposite of each other. One, it seems like nothing's happening for a very long time. And then all of a sudden, a lot happens. We've seen that through cycles in Bitcoin where nothing happens in terms of its valuation against the US dollar, for example. And then all of a sudden, a month or months, it just explodes on the world scene again and again and again. And it does it on the way down too, uh, just as spectacularly. Um, we're also seeing that with adoption. We're seeing it with innovation. We see it with a lot of things. So when people look at this phenomenon, they generally tend to think, well, nothing much is happening. It's moving too slowly. This isn't happening. It's not becoming mainstream. And then all of a sudden you get a couple of really critical applications or world crisis or something like that. And then things change overnight. I think you, you have to be ready for that. And you have to accept that you will misunderstand it, even though you know that effect is in place. Skipping around just a little bit, one of the things that you, uh, this is a question of mine, but one of the things that you kind of mentioned offhandedly in one of your talks, 
uh, was about autonomous cars. And we have been talking with a couple of experts in autonomy a, a week or so ago. We have one of these Boston Dynamic spots that's ro roaming around campus right now. The engineering students are playing with it. Mm -hmm. But you Learn said- Learn how to kill it. <laughs> the spots. One of these days you're gonna be dealing with a police spot in a protest, you reach underneath and there's a little lever that allows you to pull and remove the battery. We are now at the point in our dystopia where those instructions are already circulating on the internet. Okay, so well, that will be that'll be the next class. That's a tangent for this conversation, but a little, uh, you little know. bit of a tangent, but I, I, it's a, a useful mm -hmm. probably. Um, the um, yeah, you know, and you look at things like. Uh, you know Hong Kong and how they had to learn how to beat facial recognition cameras and other such of technology. But um, what you said in here was, does an autonomous car need an owner? And I thought that was mm -hmm. fascinating, this idea that a car that maybe is subscribed uh, in maybe even independently to Uber or Lyft or has its own driving service could accept cryptocurrencies and could um, then pay for its own upgrades, pay for its maintenance. Um, do you think that the cryptocurrencies combined with some of these other technologies could lead to almost like a, um, autonomous infrastructure or, or uh, autonomous systems that kind of just go off and do their own thing? Oh, without a doubt. I think the, the combination of cryptocurrencies that do not require personhood um, to establish ownership, together with infrastructure that allows machine-to-machine -machine payment, um, the emergence of artificial intelligence, and the ability to build autonomous um, systems of money, also known as decentralized autonomous organizations that can uh, coordinate economic activity means that it is inevitable in my mind that you will have uh, autonomy in the financial sense. You will have um, agents, software agents, um, that have some degree of uh, artificial intelligence, maybe very simple degree of artificial intelligence, managing their own money um, without human ownership at all. In fact, humans may become shareholders in these things and have some beneficial relationship but they won't actually have control. Um, and, and it's very difficult to come across this. And I use this as a thought experiment because what I wanted to do was demonstrate how a, a true form of digital money that, that does not require personhood to have agency creates scenarios that are truly sci-fi uh, scenarios. And at first you're thinking, well, that's silly. How could you, first of all, who would allow this? Um, how, how do we get from A to B? There, there doesn't seem to be a path that gets us from um, a world in which all money must be very carefully controlled and we must know who sends and receives all money. The world we live in today of financial surveillance to an environment where even an autonomous agent has agency over money. Um, so I created a little sci-fi story as to how this happens. And it basically involves um, a phenomenon in Japan called hikikomori, uh, which are shut-ins, people who live um, and never leave their house right. and interact with the world only through the internet. One of the emergent phenomena from hikikomori are elderly people who have enough automation in their life so that their bills get paid, their rent gets paid, their air conditioning gets paid, where they die in their apartment and nobody notices for months. Uh, although I think the current record is eight years um, where they found an elderly woman who had died eight years previously in her apartment and nobody noticed. Um, so the sci-fi scenario that I've created is that say that such a person starts out their life as a taxi driver and then eventually hires other people to do the driving and then eventually converts some of the vehicles in their company into autonomous vehicles and maybe even sets up some agreements so that as they're getting paid in cryptocurrency, which is routine mechanism of payment, um, the car has a monthly visit where it drives itself to a garage for maintenance and then drives itself to its overnight storage parking. And the account is automatically debited for insurance and fuel and maintenance, electricity, whatever. And then that person dies and nobody notices. At that point, that car continues to operate. Who owns that car? Well, no one. Um, effectively, it has become emancipated 
It's a self-emancipating autonomous taxi. Uh, and it's a weird concept to think of, but you can imagine that that scenario could weirdly happen. So I wrote a, a little sci-fi story about that <laughs> but to, to convey that idea. Um, we need to stop thinking of money as an activity that only humans do, or organizations, associations of humans in the form of corporations, and start thinking of autonomous agents on the internet being able to control money. Now, most of the scenarios that people think about when they think of that are horrific and dystopian. But one of the scenarios you can think of is an autonomous altruistic organization, or if you like, a robo-charity. Imagine a charity that takes contributions through some automated activity and then monitors social media or search engines or things like that for unfolding natural disasters and then is able to direct 100% of its charitable earnings to sending directly to humans on the ground uh, in the moment of a natural disaster. Very efficient, you don't need any human intervention uh, and can operate without discrimination, bias, delay, um, you know, or bureaucratic uh, interference. Um, <clears throat> wow, well, there's, there's lots, <laughs> lots in that, in that uh, uh, little tale that you just told and it's fascinating um, how we look at these internet of things and their ability to transact monetary transactions um, one of the things that uh, a number of students have brought up and I know that you brought up in your writing as, as well is we see that um, KPMG has a blockchain that you can use, and Microsoft has a blockchain, and IBM has a blockchain. We have these, we have these corporate blockchains, uh, and we even had an attempt by Facebook to have a, um, I guess, a cryptocurrency. Right? Um, how do you see um, these big institutions? Are they trying to co-opt um, this decentralized network, or is that really the the path we want to go to have more stability and avoid a dystopia, as they might have us think? Um, no, I, I I think the the Facebookization of digital currency is a very dangerous trend. Um, and it's not an at attempt to co-opt a decentralized currency system because the whole point of a decentralized currency system is decentralized. It's, it has no owner that controls it. It represents no specific point of view or interest. It's neutral uh, to the participants. It's open to all participants and it cannot censor or control transactions. That's the whole point of having a decentralized payments and currency system. Uh, there is no scenario under which a corporation would create or co-opt something like that because all of the motivations of a corporation are centralizing motivations. They, why would they have a decentralized currency that they can't control, can't control access to, can't censor transactions? Um, in fact, under any conceivable jurisdiction that I can imagine, such a thing would expose a company to enormous liability because under the law they have an obligation to censor certain types of transactions. The only reason a decentralized currency works is because no one has to have permission to operate it because no one is operating it. It operates on its own. Uh, otherwise that permission would be denied. So what happened when Facebook said, hey, we're going to do a cryptocurrency that we're going to make available in every country? You know, collectively, 195 governments around the world went, <clears throat> you're going to what? Um, no. Uh, so the problem at the starting point, the, the fundamental concept behind a decentralized cryptocurrency is that it is permissionless. It does not ask for permission. And part of the reason it does not ask for permission is because if it asked, the answer would be no. And Facebook demonstrated that. They had to ask for permission because they are a suable entity. Their entity that can also be subpoenaed and dragged in front of Congress as exactly what happened. And so they asked for permission and the answer was no. Uh, I don't think that project is ever gonna launch. Now, other companies are building blockchains. When a company builds a blockchain of their own, what we should do is take the word blockchain and replace it with the word internet and see if it still makes sense. So KPMG is building an internet. W what, why? The whole point of the internet is that it is the internet that everybody has access to. Why would they build an internet? 
well, that's an intranet. And okay, I mean, they might put some stale wikis on there and some information that never gets updated. But in fact, most of the company's work happens on the internet because we've all discovered that intranets are where good ideas go to die. So when you take that into the currency domain with a blockchain, the same exact thing happens. Um, what you're saying is, we're going to do internally something that has to compete against what the entire world is doing without us externally. Um, that's a competition you lose. Open innovation is where the game is at. So a lot of the companies are playing with this because what they're trying to do is they're trying to compromise between the decentralized, open, and unfettered innovation that comes from these open blockchains versus their internal corporate motivations and demands from management to create centralized versions of this. And they've been told that that's possible. Um, what they haven't been told, because the consultants get paid too much for that, is that it's pointless. And so they embark on these proof of concept things and they go again and again. They've been doing this since 2014, by the way. Not a single viable project has come out of it. The only ones that have actually had some traction are the ones that use the existing open public systems. We saw this exact thing happen in the 90s with the internet. Many companies, Microsoft is a prime example, were like, no, we're going to build our own internet. It's going to be MSN net, and it's going to be better and cleaner, and it won't have any porn, and no crime will take place, and it will be like the Disneyland of the internet. And everyone said, well, how boring is that? Uh, you go ahead, uh, you and you know, grandma and grandpa will be on the actual internet where all the interesting things happen. So this is just a repeat of that. Um, now, the thing is that Facebook ended up making one of those, uh, and all they've managed to do is make something that is not, you know, clean and crime free, but but happens to be kind of the breeding ground of white supremacy and QAnon and conspiracy theories and anti-vax and the destruction of democracy on this planet. Um, but they still managed to get grandpa and grandpa to go in, grandma and grandpa to go into it. So we don't want to see that happen with currency because it will attract people. But what it will do is it will attract people by robbing them of the possibility of freedom. So a number of the students have asked questions about different coins, different cryptocurrencies. And I think that they're kind of um, hinting around the question of what should I invest in? And we've had a kind of a tragic situation, I think, with Robinhood, which has been a kind of Facebook-like app that's, uh, you know, has the Candy Crush interface for buying stocks. And of course, we mm -hmm. had a young gentleman up in Naperville, uh, Illinois, who killed himself um, mm -hmm. when he didn't understand that the notification was saying, if you exercise these options, you will be in the negative, not that he was. Um, right. But we often see that you can, um, you know, sign up for Coinbase or, and certainly there's other ones that uh, are around where you can transfer money into these cryptocurrencies and use it as an investment. Um, any opinions, any ideas, any advice to our students about cryptocurrency as a asset to invest in? So um, I, I think the best investment you can make, and this is gonna sound trite, but bear with me for just a second, is in learning about the technology. And, and not just because I'm a teacher and this is a class, but because economically speaking, investment in education on new technology um, has repeatedly paid very well in returns, in terms of raw returns. Um, those who learned how to use the internet in the 90s, those who learned how to make mobile apps on iPhones in 2008, those who learned um, how to use new platforms that just popped up, like TikTok or whatever, uh, can become um, very accomplished, and not just in the core area of knowledge, but also in all of the adjacencies, right? Um, and it, it's, you don't have to be a cryptocurrency investor in order to gain benefit from understanding cryptocurrency, you know, because every cryptocurrency investor now needs a cryptocurrency accountant and a cryptocurrency lawyer. And a, so one of the questions you should ask is where does an education in this space actually work? Where, do, where can I use an education in this space? And the answer is 
unfortunately, this is only limited to those industries and professions in which money features. Wait, that's everything. Okay, so everywhere. Um, because this is impacting every aspect. It's not money for the internet. It is the internet of money. So if the internet of money just got launched, do you want to know how to use that? Uh, now, today, that's a question of, do you want to? In the future, it's going to be a bit like saying, I'm going to go into the workplace without learning about the internet. It's not really an option you have. So getting an education, I think, is the best investment you can make. Now let's talk about portfolio. Like any other investments, you have to balance um, risk and return and look at that from the perspective of your life circumstances. So um, one of the ways you can look at this as um, spice added to your portfolio, right? And just like if you're adding cayenne to a gumbo, a pinch will make it more interesting and a cup will make it inedible. Uh, you might want to think about putting a pinch of cryptocurrencies in your portfolio and that may increase the interest. One of the problems, just like with spices, is that um, you develop a tolerance to the uh, risk and excitement and that ter can turn into addiction. Uh, cryptocurrencies do tend to be dangerous for people who generally have personalities that are easily addicted to gambling. Uh, there is an element here which is very high risk but also very high return and the and the volatility where you're winning one day you're losing the other um, triggers a kind of excitement in an addictive personality. So if you know that that's you then maybe stay away from this. Um, or have somebody else manage it for you um, who, who is a trustworthy person. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I've done well <laughs> with investments in this cryptocurrency space, um, but um, I've been able to mostly by generating disposable income because I was working in the space. So um, again, education first. Yeah, the I other that... aspect of this that I would just to finish on is everybody thinks about this as a currency that you go out and buy as if you, it's a foreign exchange thing. And, and one of the first things I say to people is think about this as something that you earn through your labor. So you wouldn't go and buy dollars in order to speculate on the US dollar um, or the US economy. You would work and then get paid in US dollars for your labor. And in fact, if you went and spent a year in France on uh, as a transfer exchange student and you worked while you were there, you'd get paid in euros. Again, you wouldn't buy euros to speculate on the value. Um, mm -hmm. So the most successful way that people get engaged in this space is to work for it. And one of my good friends uh, baked uh, baklava for Bitcoin in 2013. Um, they're the, as far as I know, the world's first baklava millionaire. Um, now you can't necessarily do that uh, as successfully, but whatever skill you have, you can enter the economy and participate in it by earning uh, cryptocurrency. That's uh, yeah, that's excellent and uh, advice. And even in stocks, you have the same sort of per personality addiction. Day traders get into that, and I think they they lose eighty percent of their money. Uh, is mm -hmm. is the way it kind of works with day traders. Uh, Evan, you had a question. Oh yeah, uh, so. Do you, when you're sending like five dollars to someone else that you uh, also or that also uses a lot of cryptocurrency, do you send Bitcoin or do you send a different currency uh, just because of the, the the transaction time speed? Do you is Bitcoin your only crypto that you really use on a daily basis? Um, no, it's not. I use others too, but not because of transaction fees or speed of transaction. Uh, for the most part, the use of Bitcoin that I do is more similar to a wire transfer. So I use Bitcoin to pay payroll. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, in fact, three days ago, I just did my monthly payroll um, and about half my staff get paid in Bitcoin. And so, and in fact, uh, many of them could not get paid if it weren't for Bitcoin. So I employ people in places under currency controls, financial embargoes, and uh, hyperinflation, places like Venezuela. 
Um, mm -hmm. And the only way they can get paid is because I, I'm able to pay them in Bitcoin. So that's usually where I do two transactions a month. Uh, if it takes 24 hours for my transaction to go through and I have to pay $10 to do my payroll transaction, well, I mean, whatever. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't do it for a $5 transaction. For that, I would use the Lightning Network, which is a layer two network that allows me to do a transaction in about two to three seconds uh, that is final and cleared. Um, a transaction as small as a hundredth of a penny for a fee as small as a thousandth of a penny. And so if I wanted to pay someone $5, basically what I would do is, is set them up with a Lightning Wallet. I wouldn't use a different cryptocurrency. And the reason I wouldn't use a different cryptocurrency is because um, I would be making a trade-off. I would gain speed, but I would lose security, privacy, liquidity, and um, the recipient would be, would be losing an opportunity to be able to use that more broadly. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the pure utility of the currency, there's a reason why Bitcoin is winning this game. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not against other cryptocurrencies. I'm not a maximalist, as they call them in our space. Uh, I, I study and work in, in multiple different cryptocurrencies. But for the pure purpose of money, Bitcoin is the best. And if you want to make Bitcoin fast, you use the Lightning Network to do that. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of questions um, that maybe are related. Maybe I can tie them together. Uh, one is about... Um, markets like the New York Stock Exchange. And, and I know that uh, some of the questions we also had about initial coin offerings. So could you maybe talk a little bit, <clears throat> I know that I had some, some uh, a rig sit here that worked with something called storeJ.io where I would um, get coins because of us uh, sharing storage and, and they raise money for their company through these coins. Could you talk about that as being an alternative to like an IPO or traditional investment? and Yeah, uh, so one of the things that is, uh, that contributes enormously to income inequality, and not just globally, but even in the United States, is this um, false dichotomy between um, so-called accredited investors and the types of investment opportunities they have and the entire network of intermediaries, brokers, and gatekeepers that ensure that only accredited investors have access to startups, and as a result means that startups can only raise money from accredited investors. And that creates this very, very small club where wealth can be generated with early stage opportunities at enormous rates. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an accredited investor. I can access investments that most people cannot. And as a result, I can invest in companies. Now, did I get my accredited investment status because I studied or passed an exam or um, had a lot of experience with investment? No, it has nothing to do with that. It's an access thing. It's based on annual income. And in, in most societies, that should be considered an abhorrent basis for, uh, listen, it, before you have access to wealth, we need to make sure you first have wealth. What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. That's, that's how you keep people poor forever. So um, back to the question you actually asked me. Um, there, there is something really dangerous about that model. And presumptively it was, uh, put in place in order to protect investors from making bad choices. Um, and the idea being that if everything is vetted by organizations like the SEC or NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, then um, the, the great masses, the people who have access to Robin Hood and stuff like that, will only invest in companies that have been properly vetted. Of course, that creates enormous income inequality. So what ICOs do is they, they crack that market wide open and they say anyone can invest in anything anywhere. And anyone can make an investment available to everyone everywhere. So that means any startup in any country, any single person with an idea that they think is worth raising money for can raise money from every single investor, qualified, unqualified, rich, poor, doesn't matter who has access to cryptocurrency. And that just cracks that whole market open. 
And of course, the first response to that is, but won't there be scammers? Um, and the answer is yes. <laughs> Thousands of scammers, scams everywhere, scams on top of scams, it's scams all the way down. But <laughs> that doesn't mean that there aren't also really important companies that would never have reached investment stage, that would be an idea that due to location or access to capital or access to mentors or access to infrastructure would never get invested in the next cure for cancer or whatever. And um, also it means that investors who are, have a very limited scope of potential investments now have the possibility of, of access to investments. So um, we have a Wild West situation with ICOs and the Wild West um, is a combination of enormous opportunity and within it has the seed for kind of the, the next chapter in global investment and in startups. It revolutionizes early access to capital for startups and investors. Um, and it also represents a very, very dangerous space full of scams. Um, what we need to do now, of course, is not find centralized solutions that say, oh, let's build a mega SEC that mega vets all of these, because that doesn't scale. Instead, it's more about educating investors, about building tools for reputation management and for community vetting and crowdsourcing. Or in other words, you, we have a decentralized technology that has now created a decentralized problem of massive decentralized scams. Well, the answer is a decentralized solution that leverages a decentralized community of investors to provide decentralized enforcement and rationality. So um, ICOs are both wonderful and the worst thing that's ever happened. Um, and you need to hold both of those ideas in a state of cognitive dissonance and tried to figure out how to navigate them. Um, I think it's a incredible space. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's very interesting. And I think uh, that going back to that idea of education, right? Educating yourself on how these things work, educating yourself on the companies behind them. And um, we tend to uh, think that uh, things that are listed on a New York Stock Exchange or that are backed by accredited investors uh, are not scams. But if you want to read a good book called Bad Blood about Theranos, uh, that's a, a good scam. Or uh, Enron, we sometimes have uh, one of the guy who's the chief financial officers come to Mizzou and talk to in the past as well. Yeah. Two, um, two facts to help you navigate that space. Um, one. Bernie Madoff was the head of the regulatory agency, the head, the chair of the regulatory agency to regulate organizations like Bernie Madoff's, fact number one. Fact number two, in almost 30 years, Bernie Madoff never traded or invested a single penny of his investors' money. From day one, it was a Ponzi, from day one, Bernie Madoff uses other people's money to pay off the new investors. And it was there was never a single investment that was real in that scheme. And this was the chair of the regulatory agency. These things simply don't work. Uh, and they, they, they fail at spectacular scale um, all the time. Right. And I think that they were, uh, a lot of people were duped by the, uh, well, there's that old adage, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, mm -hmm. And that seems to hold true. Um, I had another question. Evan, did you have a, another one as well? Oh, go ahead. Um, After you. One thing I've just learned about, and uh, it's because I'm behind the times, is a fascinating thing called non-fungible tokens, or I don't know if we pronounce them nifties, but this idea that you could have digital art and you have digital rights to it, and it might even have contracts such as if, I, if I'm the original creator and you buy it for $10 and then you sell it for $100 to Evan, maybe I even get part of that revenue uh, coming back to me because now I'm more famous because I'm an artist uh, and have done better. Um, can you explain to us uh, what your perspective or um, do I have a right to be excited about NFTs or? Um, yes, uh, don't sure. let the name discourage you. I, I, I always like to say that the, the name NFT stands for naming failure total. Um, because 
if you say it's an acronym, then someone invariably asks you, what does the acronym stand for? And then you say non-fungible token. And then you have not only failed to explain anything, you further confused everybody involved in that conversation. Um, so it's a terrible name for an amazing innovation. So let me rename it for you. It's a deed. That's it. It's a digital deed. Uh, it's a digital deed to a tangible or intangible item of property. And the reason we call it a non-fungible token is to define it by negation to the other thing, which is a fungible token. Now, what's a fungible token? A fungible token is a quarter, 25 cents, the thing you have in your pocket. Now, if I held up two quarters and said, which one's better? You would say, well, they're both quarters. Yeah, but which one will buy you more? Both. And which one's been stolen previously? Uh, I don't know. They seem the same to me. And that's the definition of fungible. Fungible means that every unit is indistinguishable from every other unit. And by law, you're not allowed to distinguish between them. You're not allowed to say, well, this um, 25 cent coin, I actually stamped my initials on it. So it's now mine. Um, you don't get to make a claim like that. So a fungible token is one where all of the units are indistinguishable. They have equal value. They're interchangeable. Um, and that's a legally protected concept. Uh, a fungible token, of course, represents something that is unique. So a token, meaning an abstract representation of something like a certificate or deed, that represents an item of unique identity. Maybe that's a painting. Uh, maybe it's the title and registration to your car. If I have a title and registration to a car that says, this is Toyota Corolla with uh, registration number 356, then that's what that piece of paper means. Now, if I was to show you that and say, actually, I wanted to represent that Lambo over there, you'd say, nice try, still says Toyota Corolla 356 on it, and I wouldn't get the Lamborghini. So um, now for the, the use of these is that now we have this equivalent of this piece of paper that represents something like my car title but it's actually a digital item that's traded on a blockchain. So I can register ownership of it by having access to a private key. I can um, make transactions that I transfer that with a digital signature, just like I could with a Bitcoin. And um, I can buy and sell these things on online marketplaces. I can combine them and bundle them with other things. I can issue dividends that accrue to whoever can prove they currently hold one of these. Um, I can use it as a token for access. I can say, if you have this thing, then you can enter the magical kingdom of the Toyota Corolla service desk uh, portal or, or my um, World of Warcraft secret castle or whatever. Um, and so these have become very popular because they allow us to do things like represent digital art, intellectual property. Uh, people can use them to represent tangible objects like cars, boats, planes, um, houses. And if you have any authority that recognizes ownership of the token as equivalent to ownership of the thing, uh, then you can transfer ownership of the thing by transferring the token. Uh, and that makes commerce very, very easy. So that's what a nifty is, a non-fungible token. Um, and for, for someone who works with creative stuff, like writing books, it, it's fascinating. I mean, there's so many artists doing amazing things. One of the problems people have with this concept is when you apply a non-fungible token to an intangible asset, how does that really give you ownership? Um, because ownership generally means exclusionary ownership, meaning I own this, so you can't have it. Uh, and with digital things, that doesn't make any sense. If I own an image, you just take a screenshot of it. So now you own the image too, and yours is indistinguishable from mine. You can copy the image, but you can't copy the token. I can still demonstrate that I own the token, which means that I get invited to the, the artist's next gallery presentation online. I get accolades from my peers for supporting the arts. So if you understand that ownership of the token has unique benefits separate from the asset that it corresponds to, that can clarify why, even with digital art that's copyable, um, the ability to own a token, it's a bit like a signed copy of my book rather than just my book. 
um, is is unique and valuable to those who have it. Like a print where you get it's a print one of three hundred prints that are made you, or something. You like. you can do that with NFTs too. But and of course, I can take a photo of your print and go to a printer and print it out, and we both have one of three hundred. Except that with a non fungible token, you can prove that yours is real and mine is not because you still own the non fungible token. Right. And so the idea of um, this is a step into the future, but it's also a step into the past. You know, when the, the Medici family in, in Venice would commission Michelangelo to make a statue, they wouldn't take that statue and put it in their living room. They take that statue and it would go in the, you know, the Piazza de something in the middle of Venice and everyone could look at it. But when everyone looked at it, they were like, ah, the Medici's paid for that. And that was the value of patronage. And so in the digital realm, patronage is still a thing. Uh, I, I mean, I have a Patreon site where people contribute to my work so I can then give it away for free. It's like, well, why would you give to this person if you can get their work for free? Because they want to see me do more. So. That, that concept works very well with non-fungible tokens. And it, it creates an opportunity for artists to connect directly with the, their audience without being mediated by a platform of distribution and be able to create new experiences with their audience through these tokens. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm looking forward to learning more. Uh, Evan, you had a couple other questions. Yeah, so I have two two questions. Um, do you find any or like any reservations about Bitcoin because of the amount of power that it takes to run the entire network? And then um, the second is, do you ever think that the Bitcoin network would ever switch over to a, a, a proof of stake to kind of reduce the amount of power that it does take up? Um. Great. Let me take the second one first. I don't think Bitcoin would ever switch to a proof of stake unless it was forced to through a failure of the proof of work system. And the reason is that proof of work gives it a degree of immutability of the records um, that is qualitatively and quantitatively different than proof of stake. Uh, so if you think about proof of work, it is effectively a digital monument that takes energy to build. Uh, mm -hmm. and therefore takes energy to copy. And that is what creates the immutability and scarcity. Um, proof of work is the most efficient way to recognize a truism. And that truism is that all economic activity is energy. So let me mm -hmm. repeat that. All money is backed by energy. The only question is, what is the form of that energy when it's put into production in order to produce money. In order for money to be scarce, to be rare, it has to represent an activity that's difficult to do. And so whether that's sailing the seventh fleet and it's 45 ships into the Gulf of you know, Hormuz, into the Straits of Hormuz to threaten the Iranians, um, and therefore directly subsidize the production of fossil fuels in order to back the US dollar, because let's not kid ourselves, that's proof of work. That is proof of work that directly subsidizes fossil fuels the most polluting way possible, and, and does so with a machinery of war that is the largest polluter in the United States, the Department of Defense. So all money is backed by something, uh, and that is either energy directly, or it's energy through the um, demonstration of force or war um, or the protection of resources. When you're mining gold, you know, mining gold is not an activity where you have a, a cute uh, old guy with a cowboy hat and a panning thing in a, in a river going, I found me a nugget. No, it's basically where you, you go into some pristine wilderness that usually belongs to native indigenous people, you blow up a whole mountain into rubble, and then you bathe that rubble in sulfuric acid and pour all of the outflow of that into the rivers to get tiny, tiny portions of gold. That's what we used to base our money on. So Bitcoin uses energy. But that energy can come and often does come from renewable sources, wind, solar, hydro. And in fact, because of the nature of Bitcoin, because you can mine it anywhere, 
It is produced from the forms of energy that are cheapest to acquire because otherwise they would be waste energy or not consumed. Mm -hmm. So it gravitates towards those sources of energy because that's where you can get the cheapest energy. So if you have, for example, an oil field in Montana that as a byproduct of oil um, drilling is producing methane, um, one of the most harmful gases. Well, they can't use that to make electricity because who are they going to sell the electricity to? They're in the middle of Montana. They're nowhere near a grid. They've got nothing to do with it. So what do they do? They set it on fire and burn it in the air called flaring. If you look at a nighttime view of the United States, the second brightest area in the country is the center of the country. Uh, and it's brighter now than the East Coast at night. And that's because of tens of thousands of oil wells flaring methane and burning it into the sky. Now, people move a container full of Bitcoin miners there, plug it up to a generator with a satellite dish, and they produce money from it. And then that means that they convert it to CO2 efficiently. This thing keeps happening. So money is always energy. The question is not how much energy do you consume to produce money, because it will always be whatever the value of the money is. The question is, what do you produce that energy from and how much carbon are you releasing when you're producing that energy? And it's the exact same argument that electric cars make, which is um, if you look at this electric car and you say, well, those things use a lot of electricity, uh, a lot of energy. Yes, but if, if you replace 100,000 diesel engines in the middle of an urban environment with one plant, even if it's coal, it's still better. So this is the same argument that works for Bitcoin. We can't make it use less energy because the only way to do that is to make it less secure. Um, and we can't ignore the fact that all money is energy. All human activity is ultimately constrained by our ability to process energy. Bitcoin is the most direct way of converting energy into money without cutting out all of the middlemen, all of the intermediaries, and doing so in a very public and demonstrable way where you can measure exactly how much energy. So if you start with the assumption that Bitcoin is useless, of course, all of that energy is wasted. If you start with the assumption that what this money is doing is displacing the power of the state to make money from war that is backing oil, then I would argue it's the greenest form of money we've ever produced, which is a radical opinion. I think that's, uh, um, there's a lot of great stuff in that. And, you know, if we had a more equitable system of carbon, uh, accounting for carbon, you'd see this arbitrage, right? So you'd see- Right, exactly. So the, mm -hmm. the problem is with the, the carbon outputs of the production, not how you consume it. And, and in fact, the other problem with this is if you substitute market decisions about how energy should be consumed in a society, you run into all kinds of problems. Right. Um, well, to kind of wind things up just a little bit, I know you've talked already when we talked about investments, about investing in, in your own education. A number of these students are going to career fairs now, and, and we're, uh, uh, they're being recruited by uh, traditional folks and some uh, non-traditional, uh, non but still traditional, like TradeBot, which uses artificial intelligence to do high-frequency trading. Um, and... Uh, what advice would you have as far as uh, uh, careers in cryptocurrency, careers in blockchain, um, uh, any, any words in that regard? It's, it's a, I'll be very honest. I'll try and be very honest. Um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, on the one hand, I love working in this space. But I love working in this space as um, a fairly experienced, um, self-employed person who gets to choose my clients and doesn't have any bosses, which is kind of an idealized situation. If you can be self-employed, that's where I would start. <laughs> um, that's my first piece of advice. Um, but um, in our space as a whole, this, this is tech, for one thing. Uh, so it's a tech industry but it's also finance and there is a sprinkling of um 
kind of libertarian economics in there. Uh, that combination of tech finance and libertarian economics can be a real turnoff, and if you're not careful about the kind of place where you go get a job, you might end up in an environment that, honestly, I find rather hostile, and you may find hostile too. Um, so uh, I, I would say that you, I've met some of the smartest, kindest, most driven people who are doing amazing things, who really believe in um, changing the system, by changing the architecture of power, by changing how we look at money, by opening economic opportunity to six and a half billion people who don't have it. And when you meet people like that, they will drag you on their mission. And it's, it's an incredible experience, especially when you're young and you can take risks to work in an environment that actually has a purpose and a mission other than making money. Um, but you will also run into some crass opportunists who have seen this space as an opportunity to just make money um, and who maybe come from this very toxic intersection of tech, finance, and libertarian economics. Uh, so be careful. Um, but take some risks because if you don't take them now, you're not going to take them when you have two mortgages, five kids, and lots of obligations. All right. Excellent advice. And I want to thank you so much. And I would encourage our students, if you want to um, hear more of uh, Andreas, you can go to his YouTube channel. He's generally uh, generously put a lot of material out there. Uh, I do recommend his books. And I, uh, like I said, they're Creative Commons, I believe. So you can find them probably somewhere uh, on the internet without having to uh, buy them. Books those three books are not Creative Commons oh, they because are? they're because the videos are. So you can watch the videos that those uh, are based on on my channel for free. Um, these two books, which are college level textbooks, are Creative Commons. Okay, very good. But um, well, well worth it. I uh, uh, enjoyed Thank the uh, talks that were in here, and I really want to appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> give my appreciation for uh, you taking the time here today. And otherwise, best of luck, and we will look for you on the interwebs. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Scott. Thanks for inviting okay. me, and I hope to see you again soon.